Oi. Tim, you're the closest thing to a scion of venture capital in, in Silicon Valley that exists, third generation, and now you've brought your son Adam into the business as well. I guess your daughter. And my daughter Jessie well. runs uh, Halogen Ventures. She only backs women. She only backs women. Yeah. Interesting. And now I want to talk about what you're doing with your children in, in venture capital, but let's talk very briefly about your background. So your grandfather. Yeah, my grandfather was the first uh, venture capitalist in the Silicon Valley ever. And my dad was a great pioneer of venture capital. He, he drove Silicon Valley forward uh, in venture capital. And, um, and then I started uh, venture capital uh, 30 something years ago. And, we, um, and, and my mission is really to spread venture capital and entrepreneurship around the world because I've seen what amazing things it did for the Silicon Valley. So that's actually, it's an interesting idea. So I'm a Silicon Valley native as well, actually um, have seen firsthand how that changed uh, the, the environment. Um, but one of the arguments behind the success of Silicon Valley is actually the concentration, the networking effect of people being face to face in Silicon Valley along Sand Hill Road, et cetera. When your father and grandfather were doing it, it was far less concentrated, but it was much more military in nature, right? It was tied to... Well, my grandfather was a general, but um, my father was yeah military. He, he fought in Korea for a little while, but it wasn't military. It was more, I, I know a little bit about it because when I got started in venture capital, I would look for developments, new real estate developments, where I'd go in and if one of the people leasing it was called something software or something technology or whatever, I'd knock on the door and see if they were interested in taking venture money. Uh, so it was a whole different world back then, and now it's just the opposite. Uh, we, ha we get deal flow from all sorts of people from all over the world, and we have to filter it to just those companies that are extraordinary or going after industries that really need transformation. And, and these, the best companies have this new technology that can be applied to a marketplace where that market is um, currently served by bad, you know, bad service, high cost, unhappy customers, but you have to deal with them because they're a monopoly. So, or ol oligopoly. So that's actually a fascinating uh, insight, right? I mean, you, you come from an environment or a background where the capital was available um, and needed to seek out the ideas to one today where there's pitches flowing in the door, right? How, how does that change the industry and the dynamic? How does it change your role? How do you think about that? Well, I think uh, supply and demand constantly are in flux in the venture capital business. Uh, there, are, there are times when there's a lot of money available and, um, and, there, and not that many entrepreneurs, people willing to take the risk. And then there are times when there are a lot of entrepreneurs, like a new technology comes along like Bitcoin, and suddenly there are thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs who all say, hey, you know, now I, I've got an idea and I want to go uh, get some money. And, uh, and it is very, it's interesting how the dynamic swings back and forth, either in favor of the entrepreneur or favor of the venture capitalist. But overall, we just tend to want to do deals that are fair. Uh, where both parties are happy because you, it isn't like it's a quick hit and you go. It's more like you make an invest. When we make an investment, we're with them until the end, whatever the end may be. Uh, and so uh, we, we want to align ourselves with the entrepreneur. So when you think about that and you think about there being thousands of entrepreneurs that have opened up in, in the Bitcoin universe, for example, right? How do you, how do you go through the process of, of vetting whether an idea or what are you looking for in an idea in, in a nascent space that hasn't demonstrated its commercial potential in the same way as, say, social networks did post Facebook or mm -hmm. um, even MySpace? How, how do you think about what you're actually looking for in a venture capital investment? So we're always looking for an entrepreneur who is looking to transform one of those industries, but has a new technology or new way of looking at it. And it's, it's something that that entrepreneur was specifically you know, put on the earth for. It has to feel like this was meant to be. And another way to look at it is, 
um, is this unique enough to build a great, not just a business, but an industry around? And that is uh, rare to come by. And so we, we filter through a lot of entrepreneurs who are doing things that are me too or something with a little twist. We're, we're looking for a complete overhaul of an industry. So we look for new ways of doing things. So like this chair might have been, man, you know, people might come to me and say, hey, I got a new kind of chair. But that isn't what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who says the idea of, of putting someone at rest and comfortable in a certain space, uh, it, maybe it's not a chair, maybe it's a floating device, maybe it's something like you see in the Dune movie or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it doesn't, um, we're really looking for those sort of transformative ideas and that's why when we invest, half of them don't work. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're encouraging people to, do, to go ahead and take those chances because uh, for society, uh, society just moves forward much faster if people take risks. You know, when you, you highlight this idea of taking risk, right? Um, and ultimately, that's what strikes me as unique about the US model in venture capital, right? I mean, it, we take it for granted that people are allowed to go bankrupt or that people are allowed to reinvent themselves, people are allowed to start all over again. You know, in the history of the world, it's a relatively recent invention, limited liability corporations mm -hmm. and the idea of consumers and uh, entrepreneurs being able to clear themselves of debt late 19th century, right? Does the unique aspect of Silicon Valley where so many people are capable of failing, do you think that's replicable in other areas of the world or in other regions? Yeah, absolutely. I've made it a point of my whole life to go around and spread the gospel of, of, an, of an entrepreneurial environment, a, a place where people are willing to try things and fail and try again and fail and fail quickly and move on. Uh, and I think that that ends up uh, creating a much more dynamic and exciting atmosphere. Uh, China, until, until the new dictator showed up, China was very much a free and open society where people were, were creating on a regular basis new ways of doing things, new operations. And, uh, and it's happening all over the world now. Uh, we have the Draper Venture Network. We have something like 30 relationships with venture capitalists around the globe, and they are all using our model to create an ecosystem in their area. And many of those have become quite successful. And some of my biggest successes came because I was willing to look outside the Silicon Valley. We backed Baidu and Skype, and they were uh, in entirely different continents. All right. China and Scandinavia, yeah. respectively. <clears throat> so you see that culture of entrepreneurship as spreading outside of Silicon Valley. You referenced China and, and the change in the political climate there. Do you spend much time in China? Is well, I did, but then uh, as soon as they said the money can't, they were making it so money can't get out of China, I froze my investments in China because I'm not going to put money into a country where I can't get the money out. It's like the black hole of investment. You, you know, I'm a fiduciary. I got to take care of the money. I can't just put money in and hope that someday we get a new Chinese president who who kind of opens up, or we can't hope that that this guy has, has a change of heart and decides to either leave office or open up China. You know, it turns out that um, throughout history, I always thought it was freedom and free markets that created the great countries of the world, um, the great economic booms of the world. And it is, but it's also honesty and transparency of government. If you have both, you have magic. You have the United States over the last 200 years. You have a lot of other countries that have tried to do that and built Japan or, or South Korea. Um, if you have one or the other, it's usually okay. Uh, Singapore had a dictatorship, but they were also very benevolent and somewhat transparent, and people felt they were being treated fairly. And so if they feel like they're being treated, treated fairly and they have a free market, then the, the country booms. But if you have free markets, but you also have a corrupt government, uh, more like what India used to be before Modi came in, 
uh, I think you get, uh, you get poverty. So you, the countries have to trust their leadership and they, and, and they have to have free markets. And then it's boom. And then it's like huge economic growth and, and everybody benefits. So I, I actually agree with that. And it's fascinating to hear this come from a venture capitalist, someone who I don't typically think about as approaching the world from a, a macro or a theoretical perspective, right? I, I think of it as um, the founding principles behind the United States were a, a nation of laws, not men, right? Rule of law, mm -hmm. not man. Um, and that's the transparency, right? You can look at the books and you can say, no, this is the law, this is what I'm doing. Silicon Valley actually has played a role in, in breaking some of that, though, in the past decade in particular. If I look at companies like Uber, or I look at companies like Airbnb, right? They have made a point, bird in the, the scooter space, right? They made a point of actually flouting the regulations and the laws with the expectation that if they make the product popular enough, that it's ultimately going to result in the laws changing rather than their business practices. Does that create risk to that <coughs> environment? Is you there know, a backlash? I think when the entrepreneur starts the business, in Uber's case, whatever, there wasn't a clear law. It was, um, nobody had anticipated that we could push a button and have a car come to us and then we could go. Uh, they, they were not really thinking that this, it would be that easy. And, uh, and I think that's true of most entrepreneurs. When they start a business, uh, there isn't a law. There hasn't been laid down a law. And if they become enormously successful, yes, then they are, um, then the people will decide on a law that, that favors their service because, I mean, I, definitely we're all better off with Uber. It's been how I've been getting around for the, you know, around here, around all the travels I do. Um, and it's an amazing service. And we know we're all better off because of it, with the except, possible exception of the taxi people. Right. Uh, and I, but as a society, we're way better off. And we are, um, and the idea that now countries or states or whatever are saying, no, Uber's not allowed here or not allowed there. I think they're making a huge mistake. They, they by, may be making By trying to create a weird regulation on top of something that is a, an amazing free market that is, is not really, it's not hurting anyone. It's actually benefiting society and encouraging more growth in the, um, in the economy. So just to push back on that for a second, I agree with you that Uber is a phenomenal service. Um, but I do wonder if that philosophy of move fast and break things and presume that if you create a wonderful service um, that it's going to uh, result in the laws being written to favor that service or to respect the rights of the consumer to experience a superior outcome. Well, people need to be able to experiment. I mean, otherwise you're stuck with laws that they are forcing people into the dark ages. You don't want to have a bunch of laws that are all tied to, we don't want to be rigidly tied to laws that were put on the books 150 years ago that make no sense today. And, and it's very rare for politicians to be up on all the technology. You saw Zuckerberg being inter interviewed by all of these, these senators. That's a total disconnect. They are in two different worlds. There's no way those senators would be able to move the law fast enough to catch up with where Zuckerberg's moving. So you've got to let that happen. You've got to let great things happen. And then, um, and a lot of those companies will go out of business. A lot of companies will get started and it won't work out. And you kind of go, oh, well, you know, they were going to potentially drive a new society and, and build some future world for us, but it didn't work out. Uh, the, there is a real, a lot of things have to come together to get a Facebook or an Uber or a Tesla or whatever. A lot of things have to go right. And uh, when they do go right, then we're all better off. Yeah. And so you've got to, I mean, the U.S. has done this well. Mm -hmm. They've allowed the Silicon Valley to, th to thrive. They've allowed technology. You know, there were lots of movements to try to, put laws down on the internet and try to control the internet and 
have the government total control over the internet and tax the internet and all. The US was brilliant in letting it go for a while and seeing if, hey, is this hurting anybody? And what's actually happening here? And what does the future look like here? They were brilliant in keeping their hands off and maybe put a light touch here and there. That, that actually works very, very well. When a, a country like China comes in and says, Bitcoin's illegal, they lose all the entrepreneurs. They go to, China, they go to Japan where Japan says, Bitcoin's a national currency. Come on in. They're basically, when China clamped down, Japan said, come here. We want you. We, this is a dynamic. It is a global dynamic. And people are mobile. They can move. And, and entrepreneurs can move. Money can move. Uh, and, and I think countries have to recognize that they're in competition for the great minds and the entrepreneurs and the capital businesses, all, just the citizens of the world, they're in competition now. And they have to think about, hey, how do we attract them? And I think the Chinese government is just thinking, well, we, I like what we've got, let's control it. And that actually is a big mistake. And I hope that they change their mind there. But if they don't, we're not putting any more money in there. So I deeply agree with you in terms <clears throat> of um, the idea that we are in competition, right? I'm thinking to the next dynamic of that, because you, you, you made a lot of um, very true statements that describe the way the world should work and the way the world has worked, give or take, for the last 70 years, um, and within the United States for longer than that, right? Mobility of capital, mobility of labor, mobility of entrepreneurs, right? The unique feature of the United States that I would suggest relative to many other regions around the world was that it represented an exit voice. Right? You didn't like the way your government was treating you, you could go to the United States, right. right? And the streets, while not literally paved with gold, were certainly paved with the opportunity to behave in a manner that you individually desired. The opening up of the Western frontier expanded that. Silicon Valley itself thrived off the idea that there was a cr tremendous amount of talent and resources that came in through the defense sector and that was then liberated in a variety of mm -hmm. ways, right? Mm -hmm. But doesn't that create its own blowback feature? Right? You, you've gone on the record of being surprised how states, sovereign entities, have reacted to Bitcoin for the most part, that they have been uh, fairly aggressive in terms of the US increasingly so, China most, uh, most notably, <clears throat> have become increasingly concerned about the potential threat that a Bitcoin represents. Well, they may be calling it a threat because they're thinking, I'm losing my power. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I'm losing my power. So how do I get my power back? And that's what China's doing. But I think the great countries of the world are recognizing that this is a major opportunity. By opening up, they are, I mean, sure, they're going to lose. Nobody's going to want political currency anymore. I mean, they're going to want Bitcoin. They're going to want other cryptocurrencies. Down the road, when we can easily spend or invest or do whatever we want with cryptocurrencies, they're frictionless. They cost you less. I mean, just by, by that alone, just that they cost you less, it's going to be better for people. And so they're going to move to crypto and they're going to go away from the political currency that is, they call it fiat. Um, that's the way it's going to move. And so the countries that are forward thinking are saying, this is the way it's going to be. So if we're going to try to cling, we're going to make a huge mistake by trying to cling to our old currency. And that's why you're seeing the smaller countries all say, yeah, we want Bitcoin, we want ICOs here, we want blockchain, we want all of these things in our country. How do we attract those people? Malta, the, 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 the guy who created Binance, he was in China. And then China made it illegal for what he did. And it was a $10 billion business by then. And so he said, well, okay, well, I'm going to leave. He went to Singapore, and Singapore got kind of heavy-handed with their regulation. And so he went to Malta. People are the, the great entrepreneurs, the new technologies, the things that we're all going to live by in the future are all going to be attracted by the countries who recognize that they want these technologies. And, they're, and it's worth it to make the sacrifice of that control that they've always had over their people. And you know, what's really interesting is that, that political currencies, 
these fiat currencies are, um, are they swing with the tide. And, and I have a friend who, uh, from Argentina who said, my family's fortune has disappeared three times in my life and I've on, I'm only 30 years old. And so for th every decade, in effect, they've had some currency manipulation or government disaster or over, uh, over inflation or whatever that has forced their currency to go into a downward spiral and his family lost their fortune. Well, he looks at Bitcoin and he thinks, oh, volatility is nothing compared to, and it's generally volatile up, whereas all these other currencies, they, the, the peso is always volatile down. Uh, so I think the countries are going, who recognize this, this is going to happen, it's going to be a big part of our lives. And, and I believe, you know, $86 trillion is about how, uh, how much uh, political currency is out in the world. And, uh, and cryptocurrency is like 200 billion. So we, um, and I believe that that will swing complete, almost completely the other way eventually. Because if you've got these two currencies, you're definitely going to want the one that is global, decentralized, cheaper to operate. Uh, frictionless, you're, you're going to want that one. So it, it's interesting, even in that description, though, you're describing it in measures of fiat currency, right? So it's 86 trillion US dollars is the global stock of fiat currencies, right. and 200 billion is the US dollar value of cryptocurrency. Right. right, and if I were to describe it in cryptocurrency, I would say there's, there are 21 million Bitcoin, and that's it. And so the challenge, but that 21 right. million Bitcoin will take a bigger and bigger share of the 86 trillion dollars. So there may still be 86 trillion dollars out there, but two thirds of the value of the currency on the planet will probably be in Bitcoin and other cryptos. So it's interesting, though, because if I look at the complaint of the day, and I think this is actually part of what's driving the underlying By the way, I like that, that expression, the complaint of the day. The complaint because of the day. Because that's kind yeah. of right. Yeah. When you see the news, it's usually the day. They aren't looking forward as much as they're saying, here's what's happened today. And that is sort of what I hear is the complaint of the day. Anyway, what's the complaint? Yeah, so the complaint what's today's complaint? Well, my back is hurting me a little bit. But the, the, <laughs> the, the much bigger complaint of the day, I would actually argue, is one of inequality. Right. So there's Tremendous concerns about the, um, the level of inequality and in that distribution of fiat currencies. But if I look at Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, the Gini coefficients, the measure of sure. inequality, are far more expansive, right? The, well, that's only because it's just getting started. But what it has done is it has improved inequality because all of those people who are unbanked by fiat, because bank... Governments and banks have gotten together and created these regulations where if you wanted to go set up in a, a bank account and you had $30.22, they would push you away because they know that that bank account costs them about $200 a year, $200 a year just mm -hmm. to comply with the regulations on it. So they've created this, they keep moving the ladder up. As they regulate more, they move the ladder up and they keep poor people down. So suddenly there's a currency, those poor people, all they need is a smartphone, and they can be in the world economy. And so it's opened it up. So all those people in Africa are now a part of the world economy because they can get Bitcoin. All those people in Indonesia can get Bitcoin now. They, whereas the banks have given, had given up on them. Those island nations, all the banks pulled out of those island nations in 2011. Um, and so, uh, so they, they have no way to build their economy if they don't have a banking system. So now they do. They have this, this virtual banking system with Coinbase and Ledger and, and uh, Bit using Bitcoin and other so currencies. The to the, the total so, so you are actually bringing the bottom up much faster with cryptocurrency than, uh, than your idea that some people are richer than others in one because they have a lot of this or a lot of that. That, I think, is what you really want. You want the po poverty to go away. Well, you can get rid of the banking regulations and the, the, the relationship between the countries and the banks 
because what they've done is they've moved that ladder up and all those unbanked people are destined to be poor if they didn't have something like Bitcoin to come and save the day. But do you think that, I mean, so the statistics on Bitcoin, as I understand it, there's 32 million theoretical Bitcoins that can be in existence. 21. Is it 21 or? Okay. 21 million. And there's 21 million, I thought, that are currently in existence. No, they're about 17. About 18. 17, okay. And about three are lost. So okay. they're probably 14. So that leaves, give or take, 1 trillion Bitcoins or 1 million Bitcoins left to be distributed to the rest of the world, right? Because 14 are accounted for, three have been lost, right? 21, I'm sorry, so 4, tri 4 million Bitcoins mm -hmm. to be distributed to the entire rest mm -hmm. of the world's population. How does that become? It's a million times 10. Th Everybody's thinking Bitcoin. Oh, that's such no. a big thing. A Bitcoin is 10,000, what is it? Eight decimals of Satoshis, 10 million yeah. Satoshis. So it's like 10 million times a million. So 10 trillion Satoshis are available for the rest of the world. But that isn't really the way it's going to work. Because Explain how people, you think it'll work. Because this is a, it's a free market for all, all currency today. I mean, if I tend to move my dollars into Bitcoin because I think, well, why would I want this currency that's tied to some political force and, and where I don't, I, uh, when I have a currency that is going to be frictionless and global? I would much rather have a global currency than one that is sort of tied to a political force. As we have, we're forced to only use our, our dollars where the U.S. has friends. And, uh, and that would preclude me from using it in certain other places. And if I'm in another country, I'm in Japan, all I've got is yen. And the yen isn't really taken anywhere else. And if I'm in Europe, it's all euros. And it's really not taken anywhere else. So... Uh, so this is global and open. It's just a better currency. And there is a disconnect uh, in the amount of dollars that people have. And there's a disconnect in how much Ethereum people have. And there's a disconnect. And different people have different amounts of different currencies. It's just that all those currencies are going to be used for spending, buying things, doing whatever they do, investing. big part of it goes to into investing. And you're going to see, and, and the way I'm looking at it is, yeah, I'd rather own Bitcoin now because my belief is that Bitcoin is going to be one of the great currencies of the world. Maybe not the biggest, but it may be the biggest. And so I'd rather own that because I know there are only 21 million of them than something where it's, it's tied to some government and they can print as much as they want. So... Ultimately, the reason why the government prints, though, right, or um, that we have governments with the taxation and, and redistribution function, which is what government spending is, is that it provides a mechanism for the distribution of that, right? If you have 14 million Bitcoins that are held by those who yeah, that can be, have that no can real be, obligation. That can be done much more efficiently now, because with Bitcoin, you know, the government has to operate all of these welfare and healthcare system, healthcare insurance and social security, the pensions, the whole thing, all the government is trying to manage all of those, right? Well, they would be much more fairly and honestly and straightforwardly managed if it was all done with Bitcoin on the blockchain. The blockchain is a perfect ledger, keeps perfect track of everything. And you build in smart contracts with people, and that could be the insurance programs, and suddenly you have all of those things completely, fairly, honestly, and straightforwardly taken care of for people. So what you're saying the government does can be much better done with Bitcoin and all the associated technologies around it. You know, the, those guys who, uh, the Star Wars guys, the Lucasfilm, they, they have to pay like 15,000 people for a Star Wars movie, and they give them each like, like the median check is something like $3.82 for the lighting, the assistant to the assistant, the lighting guy. Well, and that's like the median check. It costs Lucasfilm $7 to send out each one of those checks. But with Bitcoin, all they have to do is give everybody a wallet and just drop it right into the wallet. 
They say, hey, we well, did a billion in the first week. Here's the billion. Where does it go? Where's the waterfall? You know, I was trying to do this with my venture fund. Turns out it's still very complicated to do because we would have to change it from Bitcoin to dollar and dollar to Bitcoin and all that. But eventually, I want to be able to raise a fund that is all Bitcoin, invest it all in Bitcoin in, into a bunch of different companies and have them pay their employees and suppliers all in Bitcoin and then no accounting fees. And it's done automatically and it's all built into a smart contract so that if one of those companies gets sold, I push a button, it, it just shoots into all of their Bitcoin wallets. And, uh, and it just turned out that it was going to cost me millions in accounting fees because what the accountants now have to do which I'm hoping that the government wakes up and changes, is that they every time there's any kind of a transaction, they have to calculate the capital gain on that Bitcoin mm -hmm. or loss on that on each Bitcoin, each transaction. And so I think that once people understand that it is a currency and it is much more, it has to become more stable for the governments to feel like that's an okay thing to do. But it'll it'll happen. It'll be there. It's, it's interesting, though, because what you describe, right, is a situation that requires everything to switch basically at the same time, right? Because imagine I'm one of your employees at this company and you're paying me in Bitcoin. Well, what you've done is you've, you've pushed the cost of doing business in two separate currencies, right, where 95% of my consumption basket is in U.S. dollars. So far. Happen. So far. Uh, I mean, long my term, local geography is going to consume con, is going to create ninety five percent of my consumption basket for almost any country. Right? Those unique island countries that you talk about, mm -hmm. their their most interesting feature is the fraction of their economy that is conducted in foreign currencies already. Right? So if I'm Malta, right, you know the important currency for me is actually the euro, which I have no control over in terms of. So I think you're. I, I think you're for today, for right now, you're absolutely right. But it's going to be just as easy to spend your Bitcoin as it is, it is to spend your dollars once all the engineers that I've run into are uh, display to the world what all the great things that they're going to be able to do with Bitcoin, and so that when you, so it's going to be very easy to move you know, to spend Bitcoin in one place or another, or go to Starbucks and just use your phone. You won't even have to hold around a credit card anymore. So I think that um, we're headed toward a time. This is an e it's an easy thing to say that right now, yes, 90, 95, it's like 99% of the things you buy uh, are really have to take fiat currency. But it's not going to be long before you know, it's, it becomes 50-50, 70-30. Eventually, um, it will be a lot. Actually, eventually, it will be easier to spend and invest your Bitcoin than it is to spend and invest your dollars. That's not true today. I think it's going to be, so this is maybe a major point of disagreement. I think it's going to be a lot harder than you are perhaps thinking because the technology and this is where I was going with the earlier line of questioning. The technology or the idea that this can be done without acknowledging the regulatory cost burden. Right? The reason a checking account costs $200 to maintain, as you pointed out, is the regulation of the financial system. The regulation of the financial system is in place because of the perception of the need to actually protect those who are banking, whether it's FDIC insurance fees, the actual cost of record keeping, etc. We can lower all those costs without leaving a fiat system. You do know that your bank is being hacked all the time. And Bitcoin, the blockchain of Bitcoin, has never been hacked. Okay? Yeah, the, the exchanges. People have. around right. it have been hacked. Right. But no one has hacked the Bitcoin blockchain. Knock on wood. Yeah, I was going to say. But no yeah. one has, has hacked that. Right. And so when, you, uh, when, you, when I look at my Bitcoin versus my dollars, mm -hmm. my Bitcoin is more secure than my dollars are. My dollars are in a bank that is constantly being hacked. And so we're, we're looking and I'm saying, you really think that's safe? You really think all that government and regulation is really helping you become safer? It's not. You're safer, you're safer on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it isn't safe. That money is no longer safe. And it, actually, Bitcoin came at the perfect time 
because now the banks are playing whack-a-mole trying to keep these hackers away. And suddenly there's something that the hackers can't get into. It's interesting. I, I think there's going to be a much greater pushback in general. I think you're starting to see this against the Silicon Valley approach of move fast and break things. Precisely for, as you pointed, the, the countries, particularly larger countries like the United States, value the power and control that they have. Yeah, you, I think they do it at their own peril, though. And I think there's a really interesting test you should run. Mm -hmm. Go around and ask 30-year-olds if they'd rather have Bitcoin or dollars, and they'll all say Bitcoin. Ask 50-year-olds if they'd rather have Bitcoin or dollars, they all say dollars. So I think we're seeing, and as the 30-year-olds age, they're all going to be moving toward crypto. So it's technology eventually becomes a part of our society because it just become because it's better. It's just better way to operate, and uh, and eventually that's going to happen. And so the question is, if you're a politician or a government official, are you going to get in front of that, or are you going to try to protect against it? And if you're going to try to protect against it, it's your own, at your own peril. Your constituency is getting older and will die off while the other guy's constituency is thriving, is going to grow and thrive. So the crypto constituency is going to continue to thrive. I think that's going to be interesting to watch. I think we'll have to revisit that. You it's, know, I wouldn't watch. Yeah. I would participate because this is a much better world. The world that, that where crypto is everywhere, we're all a part of this world, that is a much better world than the fiefdom world, the tribal world that we've had. And, and I, I would say participate. The best way to participate is just go get a Coinbase wallet or get a ledger and get that feeling of like putting it in, getting your, your Bitcoin downloaded onto the ledger and then going, oh my gosh, you know, and compare this, the ledger, to that big, huge building with all those people with their fancy clothes coming out of the building that you're paying to build that bank. Here, it's just like, that's my money. And it's a whole new way. You do it once, and you go, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the future of money. So I think you just told me a variant of you can't win if you don't play, but um, which is the lottery motto. It's not right? just win. It's, yeah. It's just, this is a new society. And you want to get out in front of this new society. You want to be a part of this new society. Or mm -hmm. do you want to be a Luddite? The Luddites died off, didn't they? I think they died off. <clears throat> there were victories and there were losses for Luddites, yeah. right? It yeah. was, so I actually advocate the same thing. I argue for people in Bitcoin to, to what I call get yourself to neutral, which means at minimum having some participation, right? And some ability to approach it from a somewhat objective standpoint. If I'm sitting fully on the sidelines, you know, then I'm rooting for it to fail, right? And if I'm overly invested in it, then I've perhaps allocated too much of my capital to it. I don't find myself interesting, but able there to is also the chance that I'm right and we and we do become a Bitcoin or a, a cryptocurrency world, in which case your concern was that there would be people who got super rich on Bitcoin. Well, I think they will. <laughs> so when you think about that, and so if you do yeah. like a if you do a Monte Carlo simulation here, yeah. you would be very heavy in Bitcoin, because even if I'm fifty fifty that I'm right, it's huge for the future. So I I think that's actually part of the challenge, right? Is is, is you need to evaluate what you think your underlying assumptions are. If you think it's 50-50, then 100% you're correct, right? There's also an issue of, is Monte Carlo analysis the right way to think about this? And, and mm. you know, it's important to understand that Monte Carlo analysis assumes that you have the ability to replicate the trade over and over and over again, right? There is no sunk cost in a Monte Carlo analysis, right? Um, that's not the way the world works. The world is linear in time. And so a Monte Carlo analysis linear is Linear in time, different. but it's geometric in technology. And I think that's what a lot of people yeah. miss, that you get, you get a geometric 
uh, expansion of technology, it gets better and better and better at a faster and faster rate. What percentage do you put on the idea that Bitcoin in a useful period will replace fiat currencies? You know, I, all I'm saying, I made one prediction and that was by 2022, Bitcoin, uh, one Bitcoin would be worth $250,000. And I did that because I think a lot of these technologies are coming to, to the, uh, the fore and it'll take maybe a little while for people to uh, adopt them and to start using them. And it might be like 2023, but it's in that range where, uh, where people uh, start to easily spend it, easily invest it, easily put it to use, as easily as they do dollars now. And as soon as that happens, uh, there's gonna be a huge shift because who's gonna wanna hold on to political money mm -hmm. when you can hold on to uh, real crypto money. When I, when I think about a forecast like that, so I mean, effectively you're describing a scenario in which the total value of Bitcoin rises to something like four trillion US dollars, mm -hmm. right? So four trillion, that's like 5% of mm -hmm. all the currency in the world. I think that's pretty reasonable. Interesting. From that type of point, right? And when you think about that type of wealth and the concentration that that creates, how do you engage in the process of redistribution? How do you make sure that somebody in Africa who can't afford an ASIC and who can't afford the electricity, they barely have solar into, into their facility. They certainly can't run something at 2,500 watts, which is what's required for running a, a, a bit mine, uh, or an ant man, I guess it is actually, mm -hmm. a miner. How do they get their hands on a Bitcoin? Well, they or might get a, Satoshi. Or a bunch of Satoshis, yeah. Um, well, there are lots of ways, but, but they will trade their current currency into, they're doing it now because, you know, they don't trust their own governments. Their governments manipulate their currency all the time. So, so if you've got Nigerian Naira and you need to trade it for uh, South African uh, Riyadh, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, you, right now, it's, almost impossible. You probably lose 40% of your value when you do it. Yeah. But uh, we have a company called uh, BitPesa and they turn it into Bitcoin over here, they move it over here, they turn it back into uh, Riyadh over here. So you, you, um, they are already in the process of starting to use Bitcoin there. And they will. They'll, it'll spread throughout Africa, it'll spread throughout Indonesia, South America, all the places where governments have kept their people down, uh, all of a sudden you're gonna see this whole new economy. And who brings the force to the system, right? And by, and by the way, I, I, I think that they, that's the way it happens, is their economies rise. It isn't up to the wealthy to create, to, to pass their money to the impoverished, it's, it's up to the impoverished to have an opportunity to grow an economy. And, and build it. And the, the wealthy can invest in that economy and make that, that more of a, a wealthy economy. And I think that's a better way of looking at it. Uh, there's give them a fish, teach them to fish, and then invest in their future. And I think that's the most important thing. So if I, if I stick with that example, right, um, the role of the Nigerian government or the role of the South African government is in part to provide a rule of law, right, that is paid for by issuing their own currency. Who pays for the force system? Who pays for the contract enforcement? It's great to know that it shows up on a, on a ledger that is inviable or in, sure. let's forget wrong word choice, but you know, it, it, it cannot be hacked, mm -hmm. but who, who enforces the rules? Well, that's going to be an interesting thing. Over time, it probably won't necessarily have to be some dictator with a bunch of guns. It might instead be some software engineer who's created a new form of government of governance of their currency. Uh, you, you, you're starting to see it happen. Uh, Ethereum was created with uh, as as a you know focus on smart contracts, and they're they're trying to open it up that way. So it was sort of a Bitcoin with some smart contract. Well, 
then uh, Tezos came up with another form of government that was not tied to the miners, but is tied to proof of stake. And others will start coming up with other ways of governing that kind of thing, how, how the rule of law will work. It will be, um, in, in a smart contract, it's going to be a fixed law, because if you and I make a deal and it's in a smart contract and you win the bet, it's going to show up in your account and I have nothing to say about it. And that will be a form of government, a form of the great thing about it is it's going to be transparent. It's going to keep perfect records. It's going to do. Uh, it's going to create uh, enormous value in civilization. Uh, some of the very poorest countries are going to rise because they're actually going to be the first ones to use it. It's like China didn't have to have landlines. They just jumped straight to a smartphone because they were, you know, what's the point? You know, we don't need that. We can communicate through the cells. Mm. So uh, it will be a very big rises in other parts of the world. And I think that's going to be awesome. And then the borders and the fiefdoms and the ways that we've run our governments, it's like, who's going to make those rules? People with it's humanity is going to make those rules. So again, if I, if I think about and, a system. Oh, oh, sure. and, and imagine this, instead of Instead of the way we elect our officials, and now it's just like sort of money that, you know, the union money or the corporate money that elects these officials. Well, it turns out um, with this new form of currency and the blockchain, you can start thinking about things like a liquid democracy, where I say, well, look, I believe what he believes for, you know, whatever, uh, marijuana. And I believe what he believes for gay marriage. And I believe what she believes in lowering taxes. And I believe what he believes in putting more infrastructure in. And so I give my vote for each of those to you. And then you pass them off to other people. And then they all consolidate around some leader who is just really into an issue. And I think that that, is, that turns out to be a better way of long-term organizing the planet. And we don't have to organize it. It can be just uh, uh, slow and open. And, and I think the fiefdoms are going to be very uh, instrumental in having this happen because they're going to compete for us. Uh, more and more of governance is going to be virtual. It's not going to be tied to a, a, a land mass. It's going to be virtual. And so there's no reason that like your, your health care insurance has to be done in one piece of landmass. No reason why your pension has to be managed just in one landmass. Ideally, you have multiple governments all competing to provide you various services. So if I inhabited a virtual world, I would agree with that, right? But I have a corporal existence, right? My body occupies the vast majority of my caloric expenditures. Sure. And the structure of the inputs into my body my fingertips, my eyes, my nose, et cetera, exist in a physical landmass space, right? That physical landmass space has to be governed in one form or another, right? And putting it on a global basis, right, or putting it into a virtual world, Here's there's no how real that enforcement. Part, yeah. No, but that's how that part, this ha is how that part may work in the future, which is, let's say your corporal mass is well, right now it's in Las Vegas, but where do you live? You live in San Francisco. San Francisco. So, but you're here for a couple of days. So, so uh, a couple of days worth worth of your landmass taxes would probably be paid here, and the the rest of it would be in San Francisco. Or if you travel a lot, you would pick up based on different places that you've been, and you'd pay those those taxes. And those would be only the taxes you potentially would pay for the landmass. You could potentially have the virtual services, the ones that could be done virtually, don't have to be corporal. They don't have to be here. They can be anywhere. I mean, you know, I'm sure you manage your money in different places around the world, or I do anyway. And uh, and they don't have to, they don't have to be tied to my. I, they don't have to be like living on top of me or in my little 
my little tribe. They can be outside my tribe. So the challenge, I guess, would come back to this general observation, though, right? That if that's true, right, which is effectively a very libertarian philosophy. It's not really. It's oh, a new it way of looking at governance. I believe in governance. I mean, we're better people because we have governance. But I, I mean, living in California, you know, our government has sort of gone off the rails. It, uh, our education's gone from first to 47th in 50 years. It's gone from, our business climate has gone from first to 50th. Our quality of life, with the best weather in the world, quality of life has gone from first to 50th. We've, we used to spend 28% on infrastructure, now we spend 3% on infrastructure. It's gone off the rails. But they know, they've got great weather and they have a monopoly and they can do whatever they want. And that's kind of what we've let them do. So you, And, you, you, and I, no. I would say that there's no reason that they shouldn't have to compete. For you, for me, for all of the people of the, of the not of just the state, but of the world. Inherently, I completely agree with you. I, I actually, as I have, you know, I've said this many times, the unique feature of the United States and what it changed about the world was that it actually gave people an exit voice. If you did not like the way the government was treating you, you could get up and go and you could go to the United States. Yeah, and if you don't like one state, you can get up and go to another state. There so, is some value to that too. Oh, right. And as... As more of that part of governance becomes more local and, and uh, like the landmass part, like build out physical in infrastructure, you know, get good water, get good uh, maybe electricity, all of that could be privatized too. Um, then that's fine. But those, that, that's going to be a very small, much smaller part of government spending of our taxes. And the, the rest of it, I believe, will be handled virtually. Things can be handled virtually, a lot of it. And it doesn't have to be, I don't have to use, like for, for a pension, I don't have to use somebody who happens to live in my hometown, or even my state, or even my, my government, my federal government. I, I could use somebody else to manage my pension. Mm -hmm. Well, why not? Why don't we let that happen? That should be open. And that isn't libertarian. I'm still saying, hey, I have a pension and I'm paying into like a social security or a pension. That doesn't have to be in one place. Humans are, ne they used to be a little more corporal and they used to be a little, now they're mobile. The data is actually extraordinarily clear on this. People are physically far less geographically mobile than they were. Meaning that you actually are more likely to live in the city, state, county that you were born in today than you were 50 years ago. Well, but you are also able to travel more. Yeah. And you will move if like, if you, know, you get stuck in California and you realize, hey, we gotta get out of here. Out of California. So as we think about that dynamic of geographic mobility and it's reduced in some ways, and as you point out, the travel has opened up regions and experiences that other people can have. Where do you think the world looks differently for your children and ultimately your grandchildren? We, we started with a discussion about the fact that your son Adam mm -hmm. and your daughter um, are involved in venture capital as well. How does their world look different from the one that you started by knocking on the doors of software companies? So I think that they, um, they are going to be more mobile, but but as you say, they might actually just stay in California, but uh, they are the most itchy to get out of, uh, out of California because they do realize how badly, how bad it's become. They, um, but their future is very bright. Um, and as, as I believe is the future of most of the people around the world, we, I think their world is much more integrated. It's a much bigger melting pot than my world was. They know people, their, their best friends can be from anywhere in the world, and they are. And that was different from my, my best friends were all pretty much very close to me. I grew up with them and they were, they were it was a pretty tight group. Their best friends have, are coming from all over the planet. And that, that is a new dynamic. And I think it, 
It's one of the things, one of the reasons that I believe in this, um, that the planet goes away from the way we've run for so many centuries in us against them, the fiefdoms, the, the tribalism, the, the, the fight between giants and the Dodgers, whatever it is. There's a new way of looking at the world and it's much more inclusive. And it's also, uh, they're also, the problems they look to solve are more global and the opportunities they see are more global. So this is, I, it's gonna be, I think, a very bright, a bright, bright future for, for them and for all of them. I think for all the people around the world, we're gonna generally have a much brighter future. And people don't really believe that because they watch the news and they think everything's going wrong. But all you have to do is look back 50 years and think, well, you know, most of, most of the world didn't even have indoor plumbing or electricity or whatever back 50 years. And, and, or cars or planes, or there are very few of those things that were available. Certainly not smartphones. And uh, so go forward 50 years, you're gonna see some amazing things. They'll probably be flying from place to place. And uh, just, they might even only have to think, hey, I wanna go to Vegas and boom, they're here. <laughs> anyway, great to be on your show. Thanks so I much. I appreciate for you me. taking the time to be <laughs> with us. Most I think... unique interview I think I've ever had, except for one that I had with a high school kid. Uh, yeah. That compares favorably. Yeah, absolutely.